Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's event, Real or Inflated, What to Make of Inflation Concerns. We have an awesome program lined up for you all today, so we're really thankful that you took some time to join us. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar for future use. Additionally, we are live streaming it on Facebook and live tweeting it on Twitter at the hash, uh, using the hashtag Real or Inflated Webinar. I'll put uh, some information in the Zoom if you wanna follow us on the live tweet as well. Uh, but again, thank you so much for joining us. One final note is we do hope to make today's event as conversational as possible. So please submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And now to help get things started, I'd like to introduce the president of the organization, Maya McGinnis. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning to everybody who's on the West Coast. Thank you so much for joining us um, for our inflation event today. I have to say, I, I was just telling the great panelists, this is an event I have been particularly excited for because I have wanted to learn so much about what's going on inflation and what we all see happening in this, this complicated time. And so I thought no better way uh, to achieve that and just bringing some of the smartest people on the topic together to have a discussion. Um, and it was an event I couldn't wait to attend, let alone host. So Maya McGinnis, I run the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. And just to kick things off, I wanna stress that um, we are living in this world where everybody seems to be picking sides and treating issues as black and white, demonstrating like immense certitude about all sorts of issues. Um, but really it's a time of tremendous uncertainty. And so one of the things that the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget is trying to do is we're trying to generate more focus on the policy, on the facts, on economic issues, is really promote these kinds of nuanced discussions where we're helping citizens, journalists, policymakers, all think more deeply about how to make decisions, um, assessing risks in uncharted territory, which we're in in so many places and in this huge era of uncertainty. So um, that's why I'm really excited for this group. We, uh, we have a great, great discussion ahead of us for the next 90 minutes. And um, perhaps the best moderator you could have, Greg Ip of the Wall Street Journal to lead us through it. So right now I'm gonna kick things over to my colleague, Mark Goldwine, who's gonna kick things off, um, dig into the numbers, and then you will hear from this panel. So again, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for, be, for being here. I know many of you have been to a variety of our webinars um, over the course of the pandemic. And you'll know that every single one, my first slide takes a little bit to, to load as PowerPoint and Zoom figure out how to talk to each other. But here we are. What I wanna do before we get started on, I think a really important conversation about what's happening with inflation is give some broader context as to where the economy is and where um, the government policy is. Um, as we all know, the COVID pandemic was devastating to the economy from peak to trial. Um, we lost maybe 30 million jobs by some by some measures, by official measures, um, almost that. We went from 159 million jobs right before the crisis down to 133 million. Um, we've now recovered most of those jobs, but we still have quite a, a bit left, left to go. Um, as I think many of you know, the government response was really unprecedented. We've been tracking all of this through COVID Money Tracker um, dot, dot org, and there was really responses at all levels of government. There was administrative actions, delaying tax day, um, basically putting a hold on anyone having to pay back their student loans for over a year using FEMA money. There was Federal Reserve actions. The Federal Reserve cut interest rates to zero, got rid of reserve requirements, brought back some exotic facilities from the Great Recession, created some new ones, and bought a ton of bonds, which they're still doing, um, and mortgage-backed securities. And then there was legislative action where Congress basically um, sort of authorized about $6 trillion of support to the economy. Um, some of this is loans and deferrals. So the net cost is closer to $5 trillion, but about $6 trillion of support to the economy, really covering everything. Uh, you know, about a quarter of that went mainly to businesses through loans and grants and grants that we were calling loans. Um, we had three rounds of rebate checks where we sent every, everyone um, sort of flat cash payments, huge expansions of unemployment benefits, um, a lot of money went to state and local governments, both directly and through education, Medicaid, things like that. Money on, on health care, including providers and um, direct provision of health care and things like helping to develop the vaccine, tax relief, and lots of other stuff. 
This is a lot of money, $6 trillion into the economy, about over $4 trillion of that is out the door already. Um, if Just to put this into context, um, the response in, enacted over one year um, to take of the, of the COVID recession is about twice as large as the response enacted over five years of the Great Recession. In terms of how the money is going to be spent out, it's going to be spent on about half the time. So really sort of on a fiscal impulse basis, it's at least four times as large as the, as the Great Recession response. Massive overall response. And it's shown. Um, ordinarily, when your GDP shrinks by 10%, you would expect income to shrink as well. That's not what happened. Uh, in the first quarter after the pandemic, income grew by 13% personal income. Um, and while it's ebbed and flowed as people got their different rebate checks, overall, you'll see uh, peaking this, this uh, uh, March and April, overall, you'll see income is way higher than before the pandemic, and it's been way higher than it would have been absent the pandemic. Again, thanks mainly to uh, government spending to, to, support, um, to, to uh, support people's incomes. Uh, state and local governments, similar story. State and local governments on average seem to be doing uh, better than they would have been doing absent the, the recession when you account for federal money. And even without the direct federal money, just the indirect federal support in the economy uh, has really helped to keep them whole. And we think it's made a huge difference for the economic for the economy as a whole. These are, of course, just estimates. But uh, if you kind of back out CBO's numbers, it looks like the economy could have shrank by 15% and just be starting to enter recovery now. Uh, instead, it shrank by 10%, quickly bounced back most of the way. And if you uh, believe the latest Federal Reserve sort of central projections, um, we're headed to an economy that is going to be performing at above trend. We're already back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, we're headed to a situation that we may even be back above trend, thanks in large part to fiscal relief. Uh, but I think there's actually a question of, did we go too far? It's very clear fiscal policy helped to support the recovery, but did it too, do too much? If you just look at the last package, um, it, it probably covered several times this year's output gap, uh, maybe even several times the output gap over, over a two or three year period. It was an awful lot of money to dump in the economy at a time that people already had a lot of, of money saved from, from previous stimulus and from the inability to, to, to spend as much during a recession. And there's consequences to that. And one possible consequence of really pushing on that, uh, on that demand when supply is still constrained is inflation. And I think what this panel is gonna talk about is, um, among other things, is what, to what extent are these two things linked? There's a lot of reasons that we're seeing higher than normal inflation. Now, if you look at the CPI data, you know the last three months we've been averaging 0.6, 0.7% per month. Um, if we were to have no inflation for the rest of the year, we'd be at 3% CPI. If we were to have 2% inflation, sort of you know, regular inflation, we'd be at 4%. Looking at PCE numbers as the Federal Reserve does, similar story. If we have no inflation for the rest of the year, we're still at 2.5%. With Fed's target you know, 2%, we're at 3.5%. Um, it could go even higher. So we're expecting a lot of, uh, a lot of inflation, at least over the course of 2021. Um, perhaps all of it's in the rearview mirror, and we're not expecting much going forward. Um, but there's a lot of potential drivers of this inflation, which I'm, I think that this panel is going to discuss the drivers and consequences. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to uh, Jason Furman, Tim Dewey, Wendy Edelberg, and Ian Shepherdson, uh, moderated by Greg Ipp, for a wonderful discussion on what we have to expect from inflation. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll now um, hear from each of our panelists in turn. Uh, we'll start with Jason Furman from Harvard University. Uh, Jason has, I believe, some slides to show us. Great. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, if you had given me 10 minutes, I would have been balanced because I am torn on the issue of inflation. I only have five minutes and I think more effort and ingenuity has gone into reasons why everything is transitory. So I'll put more focus on the other side of the ledger and not hedge as much as I think. Before I get to inflation, just dovetailing off of what Mark showed you, he showed you that GDP in the United States is expected to be above the forecast prior to the pandemic. That's really notable because you don't see that in any of the other G7 economies. Everywhere else, GDP at the end of this year is expected to be below, in many cases, well below what was forecast prior to the pandemic. Um, a big part of that is the very substantial fiscal response in the United States. That fiscal response, though, has brought with it inflation. Um, you can talk all you want about global factors, commodity prices, shortages of microchips. 
those are affecting every country in the world. Only the United States is seeing the incredibly rapid pace of inflation. And if you look at the last couple of months, it's even more rapid. Um, this is inflation from December 2019 through May 2021. So there's a lot more in the United States and this gap is probably gonna grow between the United States and other countries. They're not having a webinar like this right now in Canada. And if they were, they'd have Greg as a moderator. Um, as you know, there's, we need to be humble. Forecasters as recently as May, that's a month ago, thought we'd have 2.1% core CPI this year. We've had 2.1% core CPI in the first five months of this year. We've already hit what forecasters thought. Forecasters were really dismissive of the possibility that inflation could be above three. Back in February, they said there was a 4% chance it would be above three. They said a 15% chance in May. That's what looks most likely um, at the current moment. So having wide confidence intervals is important, but also not overstating inertia. There's been a big, big change. Don't just assume next year is going to be like last year. So one thing that I think gets very confused in the discussion, inflation is going to slow dramatically. I read article after article about how much inflation is transitory, autos, used cars, lumber, you know, whatever else, lumber isn't in the CPI. Um, but inflation has been running at 8% a year. There's a big difference between it falling in half to four, it falling by more than half to three, or it falling a lot to two. And so whatever happens, it's going to slow. The question is how much does it slow? I should say as an aside, inflation over the next six months is probably gonna be slower than it is next year because some of the temporary things that have raised inflation might actually be lowering it over the next um, six months. So I think there's reason to believe that something more in the neighborhood of the three or four on a going forward basis, at least for next year, is probable, or at least substantially more probable than others think. Um, the reason for that is partly micro reasons, things like the shoes that haven't dropped, in particular shelter prices are 2% um, below trend. If they just start growing at their trend rate, that will be a big increase in the inflation rate. If they return to that trend or above it, it'll be a lot. Um, services, we're just starting to see the demand there new bottlenecks could come up, oil and commodity prices associated with a strengthening of the global economy, which is behind the United States, wages, which have been rising quickly, could start passing through to prices, prices, which have been rising quickly, could start passing through to wages. Um, to say a spiral doesn't say 10% inflation, but it says there's an inertial component that we haven't seen in the last two decades, but our wage setter is really going to look at price changes and not adjust accordingly. I think the more compelling argument, though, is the macro side. We, people have talked about the shortages and bottlenecks. There's been a huge, huge increase in consumer spending on goods. It's 10% above trend. It's coming down, but it's still way above trend. Um, there's a lot of excess personal savings because income's been above trend. Consumption's been below trend. That leaves people with $2 trillion. I don't think they're going to spend all $2 trillion, but you spend 10% of that. That's a lot. Um, fiscal stimulus is waning, but there's still what in normal times would be a decent amount coming in 2022. And finally, financial conditions are just incredibly, incredibly loose. So when I look at all of that, I think that demand is going to be higher than where it was prior to the pandemic, the trend we were on, but we won't get all the jobs back right away. We may not get all the jobs back ever. And so supply won't be as high. And so for a sustained period of time, we're gonna have demand above trend, supply below trend, and that's upward pressure on inflation. I'll just conclude by saying, I actually don't think this is relevant for fiscal legislation going forward. It's relatively small and lagged. Um, sustained higher inflation, a higher inflation target would be desirable. I'd be perfectly happy with 3% as long as the Fed could figure out how to land it and lock it in. And finally, um, there are reasons to be worried. Surprise inflation may erode real wages, and it could lead to an overreaction or even a recession caused by the Federal Reserve. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jason. Uh, Wendy, we'll go to you now. I think you have some slides also, right? I do. And um, I'd like to think jump off from where 
Jason focused his uh, his attention. Can you see my slides? I'm not sure that I. Yes, can you see my slides. I think so. Yeah. Oh, very good. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to interpret what Jason said as being mostly about near term inflationary pressures, um, like really what we're going to see in inflation over the over the remainder of the year with a little bit on what we'll see next year. I basically agree that everything everything Jason said uh, is something that we should be looking out for. The the one quibble I have is. Um, I think that the that the fiscal impulse stepping down from what we see in 2021 to 2022 will actually uh, do a fair bit to slow inflation over over the next two years. And and with that, what I want to do is I want to focus my time on what we think inflation might look like over the next two years. So a little longer term than what I think what Jason was talking about. Oh, sorry, I hate so, to interrupt. I was yeah. trying to think about 2022 when I was saying three or four percent inflation. Uh, more likely three than four. Okay. My arguments were about why there's a lot more inertia in this. Okay, so um, for that, then okay. So then I think I think then I will I will try to make try to make the case that it's very likely that inflation will um, slow. Well, all right. I I'll just go to my slides. Um, so here I have um, a basic projection of GDP. It's very consensus-like. And uh, just as um, everybody has said before me, um, we expect a, an increase in GDP growth um, over the next year relative to um, what we saw last year. And that overshoots potential. It overshoots CBO's projection of potential um, both before the pandemic and even more so overshoots their estimate of what uh, potential is now uh, with the pandemic. But what you can see is that GDP growth then, um, we, we start to, GDP starts to glide a little bit after 2021, significantly slowing uh, the rate of growth between this year and next year. And I'll show some numbers on the next slide. All right, so here we are. So what you can see is that core PCE, and unfortunately I'm switching to PCE, so uh, Jason was talking about CPI. So core PCE was, was obviously quite soft in 2020 at about um, one and a half percent with an output gap of negative three and a half percent. A Phillips curve, um, and I, I appreciate that there are all sorts of problems with running a Phillips curve in the, in the current environment, but that's part of what I want to get at. So a Phillips curve is not terribly surprised at the rate of inflation in 2020. So it would have, ex it would have expected something on the order of like 1.4, 1.5%. Now in 2021, um, we think, so the output gap um, in, my, in my projection flips from being negative 3.3% in 2020 to a positive 2.1% in 2021. So, so that's that overshoot you saw in the previous slide. That swing in the output gap, if it really comes to pass, will be larger than any swing that we've ever seen in the output gap over a two-year period, um, over, well, over a one-year period since, since the end of World War II, uh, when we have uh, good estimates. So, with, and and the way this the reason this is happening is because real GDP uh, is projected to be over seven percent, and in fact I'm projecting it to be about seven and a half percent. Going forward, I project a very significant step down in real GDP growth. I am projecting something like one and a half percent. My guess is that consensus is a little above that, but still projecting a significant step down in GDP growth. All right, so now let's think about what the Phillips curve would say um, all, of the, all of these numbers mean for inflation. So a Phillips curve would say that the inflationary pressure in 2021 and in 2022 are pretty similar. Um, there's a little bit less in 2022, but, but they're both over 2%. Um, and, and certainly with any confidence interval, you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference between these two. But here's the thing, the Phillips curve doesn't get us anywhere near what we actually think will happen to inflation in 2021. So right now consensus is at 3%. Uh, I think Jason makes a good case for why it might be higher than 3%. And that, that can't be explained by 
uh, a normal measure of the output gap, even allowing that the pandemic has reduced potential in the economy. And what I'm arguing is that I think what we're seeing in inflation right now is something that we should be thinking about as speed effects. So this swing in the output gap, um, which is of course driven by a swing and largely driven by a swing in GDP growth, is putting extraordinary upward pressure on inflation from all of the factors that, or many of the factors that, that Jason just talked about in terms of you know, creating bottlenecks in different sectors. And, but, what does that, but what does that imply for 2022? So if GDP growth slows very significantly, I think we should expect that there are going to be then the speed effects that work in the other direction. And I would, that's one of the main reasons why I expect inflation to be uh, a fair but softer in 2022 than in 2021. Entirely agree that we should be humble. There are huge confidence intervals around these numbers. The one thing that I put little weight on and that would worry me and that I think more of as a tail risk is inflation being equal in 2022 or higher in 2022 than in 2021. Basically, every signal that we have in the economy, these speed effects, what we just see in a normal output gap measure, suggesting from the Phillips curve, everything points to a softening in inflation from 2020, between 2021 and 2022. And if that's the case, then I think we can uh, feel, feel confident that the normal economic mechanisms are working. And as the economy continues to slow, inflationary pressure will continue to come down. Um, all bets are off if inflation stays equally strong in 2022. And I think what that suggests is that something is happening with inflation expectations um, or something is happening in terms of what's influencing inflation that's different from the past. And that's a far more complicated world and a far more worrying world. Thanks very much, Wendy. Um, we'll go to uh, Ian Shepherdson now from Pantheon Macro. Thanks, Greg. Um, and uh, thank you, Maya and the committee for having me. A uh, lot of stuff to talk about here. I'm gonna take a slightly different tack uh, to the kind of output gap growth uh, sort of approach that we've seen. I'm gonna focus mostly on um, inflation expectations and, and the labor market for my for my five minutes. Um, the thing is that we, we've had this very remarkably startling spike, which I think has surprised everybody. Uh, Jason showed the charts <laughs> how professional forecasters have been massively caught uh, by the spike. Um, but to my mind, this can only become embedded into something more sustained that we have to worry about and that requires a policy response uh, if we see a sustained increase in expectations and if we see uh, that rise in expectations manifesting itself in faster wage growth, so we get the dreaded spiral effect. Um, so uh, my first slide there shows that um, inflation expectations have indeed risen. That's a New York Fed's measure. It's up at 4% now for a year ahead. But uh, it's only risen in line with the increase in food and energy inflation. So food prices surged at the start of the pandemic and energy prices have surged over the last few months. Now, those two things, things that people buy very frequently, they have a really big impact how people think about future inflation. And the rise in expectations that we've seen so far is no bigger than I would have expected if I'd known how crazy food and energy prices were going to go. We haven't seen anything yet that I'd call sort of an overshoot that would signal some sort of sustained core inflation fears on the part of the public. Um, you know, that, that's maybe because when you strip out the components of the, of the PCE, which are not COVID related, then it hasn't really moved very much. The, uh, the Dallas Fed's trimmed mean PCE measure uh, has barely changed, actually slightly lower than it was before COVID. It's risen a little bit in recent months on the reopening story, but it's done nothing compared to what we've seen uh, in, the, in the headline and, and, and the core. And, and so at the moment, the inflation expectation story, I don't think it is unduly terrifying. Um, and neither, uh, probably anyway, is the actual labor market environment, but we do need to think about how that might change. So, um, the, the, the issue here is, is that as of right now, uh, businesses are screaming that they can't find the people they want to hire. We've got record highs in the jolts, uh, jobs numbers, and we've got record highs in the NFIB small business survey. Jobs hard to fill. Labor is the biggest problem. There's lots of these different measures. They're all through the roof. 
either at or very close to record highs and, and all rising vertically there's the NFIB, the blue line. Um, this is year over year wages and salaries. Now the year over year numbers depressed by the initial COVID hit, but the, the latest quarterly reading was, was 4%. So um, as you can see that wages were really the dog that didn't bark in the whole of the last cycle. The Fed was fairly constantly scared about them, especially after the, the middle of the decade when the surveys reached the same peak that we'd seen in, in 2007. But the wage numbers never really, uh, never really got a grip. Um, and if that repeats itself this time around, then, then that spike in inflation that we've had so far uh, won't become embedded. Uh, the problem is that nobody really knows. All we know for sure is that right now we've got excess demand for labor because uh, every measure is very strong, um, except, of course, that that demand can't be met because the participation rate is still very depressed, uh, very depressed among both men and women. So we've had a rebound of about half of the drop in participation that was triggered by COVID initially. And most of that rebound took place last spring. So over the last year, participation has been essentially flat. So there's millions of people missing from the labor force. Uh, and and if, that, if that remains the situation going through the second half of this year and into next year, then that excess demand is gonna manifest itself uh, in faster wage growth. And the problem is that nobody knows for sure why these people are still sitting outside the labor force and nobody knows for sure how many of them will come back in or how quickly they'll come back in so there's there's two big theories the first theory is that the problem is the 300 dollars per week enhanced unemployment benefit which expires for everybody september 6 but it runs out in 26 other states earlier because the states have chosen to stop taking the money uh, the thinking being that it will push people back into the labor force. Too early to tell whether that's going to happen, but certainly it's a theory and it, it seems reasonable. If you're being paid over the summer to do nothing, uh, and for a lot of people, the benefits are above the previous wage they were earning, well, why not take it? There's millions of jobs available. Grab one in September when the money runs out. The other side of the coin is the idea that actually, if you look at the participation numbers by, by gender and by age, what you'll see is that the people who are missing from the labor force, so this is the people who uh, the change in participation among women over the last year, so since the low point, uh, you can see the people who are missing, the women who haven't come back into the labor force are the 35 to 44 year olds and the 55 pluses. In other words, the parents were school age kids and the grandkids uh, and the grandparents of those kids. So they're the ones who haven't come back in. And it's similar, they're not quite so dramatic for men. So I don't think there's a simple single explanation for the missing millions in the labor force. I think it's a combination of factors. I do think the benefit thing is important. But um, about 60% you know, of the drop in the labor force relative to the pre-COVID level is due to these two age cohorts, where I think childcare probably is the, is the primary issue. And maybe among older people, it's, it's lingering COVID fear. Anyway, we don't know is, is, is the bottom line. And, and so there's enormous uncertainty over what will happen in terms of the wage response to the initial spike in inflation. Uh, and if we get that big wage response, then, then we have a problem. And if we don't, we won't. But at the moment, anyone banging the table claiming that they know what's gonna happen, I'm afraid is, is killing themselves. We, we just don't know. Uh, it, it matters enormously because unit labor costs, so you know, wage growth adjusted for productivity growth is, is a great leading indicator of, of US inflation. This chart doesn't work for Europe, doesn't work for the UK, doesn't work for Canada, works really well for the US. Rate of growth of unit labor costs leads core CPI by three or four quarters. The latest numbers appear to be terrifying, but they're all COVID shredded. What really matters is if you look across the last cycle, we had a very long period of subdued unit labor cost growth, 2% or less, and that gave us 2% or less in inflation as well for a very long time. So this gives us an out. If, you know, if, if wage growth accelerates, but productivity growth picks up as well, and I'm quite bullish about that, and maybe want to talk about it later, then we might see that the wage growth is offset by the productivity and unit labor costs repeat that very benign story that we saw uh, in the last cycle. Uh, but again, we don't know. And you know, after two decades of disappointment in productivity, you've got to be quite brave to stick your head on the line and say that it's going to be so much better this time around. But, but it could be, and it could offset uh, the wage story. So this to me is the mechanism that we need to think about. I can't give you any firm answers because I don't have any, but I think at least we can identify the, the areas of risk. Um, but just if I can make one more point, just finally, and the humble word has been used a couple of times, I'm going to use it again because I think it's hugely important that economists who aren't very good at being humble um, recognize that the uncertainties here are just unprecedented. We've never seen an economy that looks anything like this. Um, and so bearing in mind that there's only really been two big sustained inflation shifts in the last 60 years, one of them up from the mid 60s and then one of them down in the early 80s. Um, 
you know, to call a big shift now is really quite a big deal. But I just make the point that that upshift in the 60s and the downshift in the 80s, both of those were not really anticipated at the time. There was a great deal of resistance to the idea that there were structural changes when they happened. A lot of pushback in both directions. People didn't believe the upturn in the 60s would be sustained. And they didn't believe the downturn in the 80s would be sustained. You know, I remember in the early 90s, even a great deal of resistance to the idea that inflation had been vanquished on a sort of structural basis. So, um, you know, we do get caught out by these things once in a generation or once in two generations. Uh, and I think it's it, it's risky to assume that what's happening now is not a structural change. But, but equally, uh, there's not enough evidence to say, to say one way or the other. But, you know, big changes come about rarely. But the point is that when they happen, that markets, media, everybody, the commentary and politicians tend to be in denial for several years after the change has taken place. Uh, and so we, we have to be really careful about you know, how, how, um, how rigid we are in our thinking and accept that whatever our core view might be, the range of very plausible outcomes either side in these specific circumstances is absolutely enormous. And let's not get caught, us, get caught in the mentality of the 60s when that inflation upturn was, was denied for years until it was until it was undeniable. So uncertainty is really the name of the game. We know what the unknowns are, but we just don't know what the outcomes uh, will be. Uh, thanks very much, Ian, very illuminating. Uh, and finally, we'll turn to Tim Dewey from the University of Oregon. Tim, can you turn your camera on and unmute yourself? Okay. I've got that and up and I was not going to do slides, but uh, I put some together as I listened to uh, the previous presentations. I did have uh, quite a bit of agreement with what's, uh, what's already been said. Uh, that's kind of the, the problem of being the cleanup batter. Um, but I did want to build on a, a couple of points. Um, first, uh, I think, you know, one point that gets missed in the media and doesn't get talked up very well, and we, we've, we've worked with that in this panel, is that you know, most of us anticipate that at least this initial inflation surge is, t is clearly tr transitory. There is going, you know, there's likely to be a persistent element. Um, I was a lot of agreement with Jason's points about uh, uh, the demand side really pulling uh, a, a lot of, uh, having a lot of uh, upward force on inflation uh, going forward. Uh, but but still, I think you know we're also not expecting the seven eight percent annualized rates in CPI that we saw earlier this year continue indefinitely. So so we're not really looking at a hyperinflation story just yet. Even though, as, as Ian said, we should be you know uh, uh, somewhat humble about whether we're on the verge of moving into some kind of dramatic shift in the in the um, uh, uh, um, in the in in the future. Um, I also like to point out and uh, that within the narratives that we tell that lumber is not a good narrative <laughs> as far as the uh, inflation story goes. Uh, the rise in lumber, the fall in, in the fall and subsequent fall in some lumber don't really tell us a lot about the underlying inflation dynamics. I clearly the people on this panel have been getting around the issue of wages, inflation expectations, um, those sorts of things um, uh, feeding into uh, the underlying inflation dynamic, and that's not lumber. To the extent that lumber is an issue, is you know theoretically, if you did get a number of these you know, negative supply side shocks, they could influence you know uh, inflation a little bit higher on a persistent basis, which would then in turn um, you know maybe raise inflation expectations. But that's a longer process. Um, also, you know even though lumber prices have gone down, steel prices have gone up. So. It, you know, that, that's just not an, a narrative we should be telling. Um, I do think a narrative we should be telling is, is inflation going to be a little bit higher or a little bit lower, you know, than, or is it, is it gonna be within two to 3%. Um, so I'm not quite as uh, pessimistic as Jason, although Jason, you know, clearly would like to see higher inflation. I, I don't think the Fed is going to adopt a higher inflation target anytime soon. Um, but I do think, you know, that the, the debate should be centered around something a little bit above 2% rather than, than hyperinflation. And we have lots of reasons to think, I think that we will have some persistently higher inflation that we have to kind of look through um, going forward. Now, a, a couple of other points I like to make on this, um, uh, specifically um, with respect to, say, inflation expectations. Um, we, I think you have to look at the longer run inflation expectations rather than the shorter run inflation expectations to see how um, uh, you know people are, are likely processing incoming data. Um, and we've seen these longer run measures uh, 
tick up and it's not a recent rise. I mean, basically these measures have been rising since the pandem pandemic began. Um, so uh, to me, that suggests that this dynamic that's changing of inflation expectations while not worrisome at this point, certainly has some longer legs than just the last couple of months of inflation data. So that would make me, um, uh, again, uh, from from if I was if I was a monetary policymaker, I'd be very optimistic here that we have we worked to firm up inflation expectations closer to two percent or something closer to what the what would be consistent with the Fed's target. Um, uh, so that that would be good. I'd be um, though also a little bit worried that I don't want necessarily want those drags significantly higher. And so I think you know if they settle in here, that's great. Um, uh, but I think there's a possibility that they're going to uh, uh, continue to edge higher. So that's one thing I, I, I wanted to point out. And another that, that we've been talking about, um, uh, and sort of Ian mentioned here as well, is uh, what's going on in the labor market? How much of this labor supply issue is going to sort of resolve itself over the next year? Uh, and how much is going to be really more persistent? I mean, those are the two words we're, we're going to use here, transitory and persistent. Um, I've, I've kind of been following the, uh, the beverage curve since the, uh, um, uh, since the pandemic began and noticed that it has made a very large shift uh, uh, to the right. Um, we talked about this after the last um, uh, recession uh, and we made kind of this smaller change to the right here where um, uh, you know, we ended up with a high unemployment rate and slightly higher job openings rate relative to the prior trend. You know, where we're at right now is uh, uh, clearly in, in, in a whole different world. Uh, you know, we have very you know, high level of, of job openings relative to the unemployment rate. And this would be very much consistent with, it, with, with an increase in, in the um, uh, natural rate of unemployment, at least in the short term. So we could be bouncing up against many more labor constraints in the near term uh, uh, than, than, than we anticipated. So this would be another reason to think that you know, we have some elevated upward pressure on employment um, and therefore, you know, likely, you know, wages and then uh, that could translate into more sustained um, uh, um, employment, game, excuse me, inflation games. Another issue around this that I've been watching is we've been bidding up uh, lower wage the lower end of the wage spectrum, at what point do we bid that up enough that really cut, cuts into the, the bottom of the next tier? And then what point does that really fuel more and wage gains throughout the um, uh, um, uh, throughout the, 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 the economy. So I'm thinking to what extent do you push up wages for, um, uh, you know, entry level or near entry level uh, retail workers to uh, the entry level of a teacher's salary? Um, and then what does that look like going forward? I think that's, a, that's something we should be cognizant of when we think about this inflation situation going forward. And then finally, looking at the beverage curve, um, uh, looking at you know, level job openings, uh, um, there's a good chance that when we sh if, if we shift back to a sort of a normal place, um, we're gonna shift back to a normal place at a high level of resource utilization. Uh, so, you know, we're going to go from uh, very hot to just hot uh, with possibly some, some different expectations going into that. So I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned that a 1970s style inflation is around the corner. Uh, we, we almost certainly are going to have to take a number of, of, of steps to get to that kind of outcome, uh, although humbleness, uh, I think, here is relevant. Um, but at the same time, we could have inflation in a range here going forward that's um, a little bit complicated for the Fed uh, to decide how much are they going to be willing to accept and under what conditions are they going to be willing to accept uh, that, that higher inflation. So I'll conclude there and uh, we can uh, move forward. Uh, thanks very much, Tim. Um, I would like to start this conversation now with a really basic question. You know, when I was growing up, inflation was very high, and you didn't actually have to ask people whether they cared. Inflation has been low for a long time, and I think in that context, one of the reasons we're having this conversation today is because a lot of what we're seeing is surprising and outside of our recent experience. So to sort of like really go back to the very basic, when I say basics, the kind of stuff that people like you, Jason, and you, Tim, teach to your first year students, why do we care about inflation? Why does the ordinary American care about whether inflation is two or three or 4%? And, and, and um, like who, who does inflation hurt? Who does it help? 
And as part of that answer, could you also comment on whether you think there is a difference between inflation of 2 or 3% and what some people euphemistically call runaway inflation, and whether those are two really, really different scenarios? Uh, Tim, let me start with you, because you just finished off, and, I, and you do teach economics for a living, so I think you're well-placed to answer this. I, I, w I will say that um, uh, teaching inflation is, is one of the hardest parts of the, of the job. Uh, because the students basically have no experience with the kind of high inflationary environment that that we you know we we have been associated with in the past. So this is this is a big challenge. So why is this something we should care about? Um, and I, I would say first of all, the the answer is really um, uh, on one hand, I'm not sure that that the difference most people are going to differentiate between two and three percent percent inflation very easily. I'm not sure that you know I, I'm terribly worried about inflation in that range as as um, uh, a real problem. I think the more of the, the, the um, uh, issue is, can we keep it fairly low and stable? Uh, so I think it's really that, that varying rate of inflation that really impacts people's um, uh, um, behavior and uh, um, concerns about, about, about how prices are necessarily affecting their lives. Another factor I, I like to make uh, note of is that you know, inflation rate is just an average. Um, you know, certain groups are going to be more affected by higher inflation than other groups. So, for example, as the population ages, the um, uh, inflation rate faced by seniors might be higher than the average. And so what does that mean for seniors? What does that mean for um, uh, the, the political um, uh, concerns about inflation uh, uh, going forward? Um, and then another issue that, that, that is relevant is to what extent are, is inflation eating into uh, wage gains. So, for example, we know workers right now have gotten some strong wage gains. Are those wage gains going to be eroded by inflation? Are they going to be better off at the end of this? How much is the Biden administration's agenda to make build back better going to stick if we have higher inflation? And then there's a whole other set of issues surrounding hyperinflation um, that, that don't seem to be quite relevant. But, but those are clearly, if we go back to the 70s, those were issues that people cared about quite a bit because it was uh, interfering with their daily lives. Thanks a lot, Tim. Well, I guess, um, Wendy, I want to turn to you now because in your presentation, a lot of your analysis of where you think inflation is going, you see through the model of what we call the Phillips curve. Now, for those listening who are not economists and uh, actually have real lives out there. The Phillips curve is a relationship that was established empirically many decades ago, which suggested that when unemployment was high, inflation was low, and when unemployment was low, inflation tended to be higher. And the notion behind that is when unemployment is low, the economy has very few resource, spare resources to draw upon, and it's easier for higher wages and higher prices to be passed along. However, there's been a lot of research in the last few decades that suggests that the Phillips curve is not such a good representation of reality any longer, that you can go from periods of very high to low unemployment and back again, and inflation just doesn't change very much. So Wendy, my question to you is that implicit, well, explicit in your forecast and implicit in the other panelists' forecast is that an economy that's overheating because of all the fiscal stimulus is going to follow those Phillips curve models and give us inflation. But should we actually reject that, hypo that, that hypothesis, given how poor the Phillips curve has been as a predictor of inflation for so long? So first, Greg, let me say thank you uh, for defining what the Phillips curve is. <laughs> Should have done that. Thank you. Um, and 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 I'll just also quickly say that because um, the reading of the unemployment rate right now is is such a, a a misleading measure of where the economy is, I ran the Phillips curve with just a different measure of slack, which was the shortfall of output relative to potential output. Um, so right now the economy is running cool relative to its sustainable potential and. My, my guess is very quickly, we're gonna to get to a point where the economy is running hot. And so it's, it's not that I think that the Phillips curve is misleading. I think what the Phillips curve, what, what, what the relationship between inflation and slack over the last couple of decades has shown is that slack doesn't have, changes in slack don't seem to have uh, very large effects on changes in inflation anymore uh, in contrast to, to previous decades. But they still have some effect. Um, one of the reasons we think that we empirically don't see a very large relationship is because inflation expectations uh, are so well anchored. So if all of the actors in the economy, if the lenders, if the investors, if the business owners, if households, all basically expect the Federal Reserve to be able to maintain 
2% inflation, which is their target for core PCE inflation, if they all basically expect 2% inflation, then they'll see through uh, changes in slack from one year to the next, and they'll say, well, that, that'll have a little bit of effect, but we strongly believe that the Fed will keep it at two. And so they set their prices that way, they set their wages that way, they set their interest rates that way, um, which, which is a really important price in our economy. Um, and, and so we think that that's one of the big reasons why we've seen less of a relationship between slack and inflation. Um, so it's still there, just less. Now, we've had such a dramatic change in the slack in our economy since the beginning of the pandemic that even a small empirical relationship between slack and inflation still suggests uh, a drag in prices. So my point in, in showing that the Phillips curve um, can't really get anything like what we're seeing, what we expect to see from inflation this year is, so I start thinking, okay, so where else should we be looking if it's not just the, this relationship between slack and inflation? And, and that's when I get to how very quickly the economy is rebounding. Um, so, so the last thing I want to say yeah. is because, because I think this is the critical point. If it's the speed of the rebound, then I think that means we need to talk less about slack and more about speed. So all of these things about the economy running hot, actually, I think we should be talking less about and more like, wow, we are recovering crazy fast and that's having big effects. Uh, thanks. Uh, so Jason, um, Oh, can I just address speak, I'm just, I, well, I'm just going to say that. So you gave, because of your time limitation, you had to give the unbalanced hawkish view on inflation. So I'm going to like basically exploit that a little bit. I'm just going to point out that implicit in your forecast and your def, you know, the imbalance in supply and demand is this Phillips curve view of the world that once you run the economy past a certain level, inflation dynamics result. But just to sort of like take the other side of the conversation that you didn't have time to make, the core of Fed Chairman Jerome Powell's argument for why he's not worried is, as he says over and over again, inflation dynamics do change, but they do not change on a dime. And he constantly points out that in February of 2020, before the pandemic, unemployment was 3.5%, a 50-year low, and inflation was below target. So that gives him a high degree of comfort that these Phillips curve dynamics that are more or less central to the hawkish case simply aren't going to generate the problematic outcomes. So your response. So first of all, you know, another model for thinking about inflation. If you told me we were going to do something and everyone in the economy was going to spend 10% more money in nominal dollars, what's going to happen to inflation? I wouldn't be interested in a Phillips curve. I wouldn't be interested in the unemployment rate. I'd say if everyone is spending 10% more dollars, maybe we could squeeze out 2% more output because people can work really hard. And prices are going to have to go up 8% you know, to make up the difference. And so to some degree, I think the simply stepping back and saying everyone has more money, everyone wants to buy more stuff, we can't make that much more stuff, therefore prices must be higher, without having that intermediary step of the labor market is useful. Second, the Phillips curve is working better now um, than I think Wendy thinks it is. And it depends which Phillips curve you use. Um, you can put openings, uh, job opening rate on the right-hand side of Phillips curve. If you do that, your Phillips curve in normal times isn't quite as good as putting the unemployment rate on the right-hand side, but it's, it's decent. Right now, that's predicting super high inflation. I think any model that says we still have an output gap and that's what you're putting into your Phillips curve is, is crazy. I, I think in the labor market, in some sense, relevant sense, is hotter than it's ever been or not hotter than it's ever been, it was almost as hot as it's ever been in terms of the number of jobs out there, how quickly, oh, job openings that are out there, how quickly wages are rising and the like. Um, in terms of turning on a dime, I think there's sort of two concerns I'd have with Chair Powell's view. Um, one Wendy articulated, which is the speed limit one. What we learned in the pre-pandemic period is that you can lower the unemployment rate by half a point a year every year, year in and year out, or raise the employment rate by that, we didn't learn that you can make a really, really rapid change. So we just don't know, that's untested. And second, you know, we just had a huge fiscal policy. We have a huge amount of inflation compared to what we've seen in recent decades. That could change perceptions. Um, as a business sits down in September to set their wages for January, 
are they going to think about inflation? Um, and it's sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. If they don't think about inflation, then real wages are getting creamed next year. If they do, then nominal wages are going up. And you know, with that, maybe some pressure on prices. Thanks. Um, uh, the, uh, I think everybody agrees that um, irrespective of whether you think the Phillips curve is working or not, that what's going on now reflects both demand pressures because there's a lot of spending going on and supply pressures because there's a lot of you know, constrictions on supply, whether it's supply of labor, supply of lumber, supply of semiconductors or whatever. But I think the thing about supply we always have to remember is that we live in a market economy and the price signals do their magic, which is that supply tends to respond. And that we've already seen, for example, you know, uh, like people who are hoarding lumber have started to release an extra supply. There was a report this weekend by Goldman Sachs that's approximately one percentage point of the current inflation rate does reflect identifiable supply shortages. And they sort of like, you know, uh, evaluated when they thought the semiconductor industry would be able to start to re relieve some of the pressure on chip supply, which is holding back cars. When, for example, um, we might see the airline industry put back into operation all the necessary uh, aircraft and so on. When the chicken growers can actually start producing all the chicken wings that the reopened bars are asking for. And if you take that sort of like supply side picture, then you might sort of say, well, uh, the reason we think this inflation is transitory is precisely because we think that supply will respond. Ian, I would like to ask you that. How, how optimistic are you that the supply side of the economy will do what it's supposed to do, whether it's for labor or semiconductors or chicken wings, and relieve these pressures in a timely manner? And then we will basically look back and say, it's okay. It was really no worse than like 30 days with an oil you know, oil shut down. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a point where economics is like comedy because, you know, timing is everything. So I, I'm quite confident that if demand is sustained at a, at a substantially higher level than the, the prior trend for an extended period, then there will eventually be a substantial catch up in supply. The question is whether that happens fast enough to prevent the inflation consequence of that initial overshoot in demand being reflected in rising inflation expectations and then uh, back into uh, into the wage numbers. Um, and, and here we have this gigantic unknown that, that Jason's alluded to. We've got this two and a half trillion dollars of extra savings, which is sat on the sidelines. And most of that money um, in the hands of consumers, you know, it, it, it's mostly just sat in bank accounts. Uh, the, uh, the, the balances of, of household bank accounts are at a record high. They've, they've risen vertically over the last year. Same is true of corporates as well. So there's an awful lot of, of untapped spending power there, which could come out, we don't know, but it could leak out into the economy uh, at a fairly rapid pace over the next year and give us that sustained imbalance between uh, demand and supply that no matter how well-intentioned businesses are and how determined they might be to push extra supply, you know, to, to, to dig out more oil from the ground, to chop down more trees, to add more you know, branches of McDonald's or whatever it takes to add that supply that, that people want, they may not be able to do it uh, fast enough uh, to prevent the initial inflation shockette becoming embedded. I got to say, I'm more worried about this in the services sector than I am in the goods sector. You know, this is a services economy. About roughly three quarters of the core PCE and the core CPI are services rather than goods. So I, I've never got very excited about lumber prices. And, and even this spectacular spike in used car prices, it's kind of interesting and entertaining, but it's not really where the medium term inflation risk is. That's very much in the, in the services sector where the big productivity growth that we've seen over the last year in manufacturing is, is much harder to replicate uh, in services where, where tooling up supply, it can be quite uh, difficult. Uh, and where, of course, there's been enormous uncertainty over the last year. So, you know, some of the story is just getting those planes out of the desert and back into the sky. But, but it's, it's much more than that. It, the, the, really, the, the really big question is, you know, what the heck do people do with two and a half trillion dollars over the next couple of years? Because if they run it down quickly, um, uh, you know, or, or, or run it down at a, a sustained rate that the economy just can't keep up with, uh, and then we have that first precondition of, of a medium term inflation risk. And then the next question becomes, well, does the Phillips curve kick in in those labor market numbers? And, uh, you know, again, as Jason said, those job opening numbers are, are really remarkable and they're, they're a threat potentially. Uh uh, any, anybody else want to jump in there? Jason, you have a, a I'll, thought on I'll that? I'll be super fast. I think the supply stuff you're set, the first half of this year, inflation was less bad than it looked because of all the used cars and semiconductors and all that. The second half of this year, it's probably going to be the opposite of that. Inflation is going to be a bit worse than it looks in the headline as those shortages resolve itself. 
which is why I think you're probably going to have a faster inflation rate in 2022 than you have in the second half of 2021, because as artificial factors. Um, second, in all of this, I just keep coming back to, for me, the experiment of comparing next year to 2019 is easier than comparing next year to this year, because this is such a freakish year. And I think relative to the trend we're on in 2019, demand will be higher next year because of all the money people have, the fiscal support, et cetera. And supply will be lower because some people will have prematurely retired or left the labor force or whatever, unless productivity saves us. That's the big wild card. And so we're going to have at least another year, year and a half of demand being higher than supply and that putting upward pressure on prices with some of that disguised as the bottlenecks move in and out. Yeah. And, and um, are, you, are you done, Jason? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Tim. Uh, uh, I would I would add a, a, a couple of points. I, I agree with Ian is that we we we, do, we should be watching the service side of the, the economy. It's like very labor dependent, and um, uh, we could see some uh, uh, significant price uh, wage gains in that sector that almost have to get filtered through to prices. Um, uh, in the near term, a lot of this depends upon really the length of time we have for businesses to adjust the higher la uh, labor costs and input costs. Um, and the less time they have, the more they'll end up pushing that through uh, into higher prices, especially if we're in an environment, as, as many people commented, where people do have excess cash uh, and could absorb those higher prices. So that, that, that I think, speaks in that direction. Um, as far as we, we've talked about some of the fiscal impulse de declining next year, um, one thing I, I, I kind of like to mention is that I think state and local budgets are going to be fatter than people anticipate going into next year. Uh, and that will, I think, compensate for some of the fiscal, the federal, um, uh, um, uh, f the lack of federal impulse or the low, lesser federal impulse be compensated for in this other direction. So I don't think we should, we should uh, you know, forget about, again, the potential for this to be a longer, more persistent period of tightness than just the first couple months in getting um, uh, semiconductors back uh, online. Uh, Wendy? Uh so I completely agree that the level of economic activity relative to potential in 2022 um, will be comparable to, will be, will be higher than what we saw pre-pandemic. I totally, which, which is another way of saying, I think in 2022, we will be running a hot economy and that on its own creates inflationary pressures. But I'm just going to take one more run at trying to, at trying to convince people that that the, the speed effects matter. So the fact that we saw, so, that I think we're going to see such enormous GDP growth between 2020 and 2021, I think is leading to, to these inflation. I mean, we've talked a lot about the bottlenecks created by these you know, extraordinary increases in demand. I think that speed effect is one of the big reasons that we're seeing inflationary pressure this year. And as people, as businesses, uh, respond to that and they increase capacity, history would suggest that they're going to overshoot. They're going to create too much capacity. Um, we're going to, and then, and then they're going to be confronted in 2022 with a massive, I think, a very significant step down in GDP growth. And my guess, my strong guess, is that that puts downward pressure on prices. Um, Allowing for the possibility that, you know, I, I, I take seriously that there is this big stock of savings out there um, among households and that state and local governments are good. Yes, I agree that their fiscal positions are going to be good. And so if, if you know, GDP growth in 2022 is a lot faster than I'm projecting it will be, then my, my story is wrong. My thinking is wrong. But I, I think we shouldn't just be thinking about the level of economic activity. Thanks. Um, I am... Uh... You know, we're, we're an hour into a panel discussion about inflation, and we've barely discussed the Federal Reserve, which is actually quite surprising to me as a former Federal Reserve reporter. So let's correct that problem right now. Now, for some time, the Fed has had a target of 2% inflation. And they've generally said, well, we don't want it to be higher or lower than that. So if it goes above 2%, we're going to basically do it. If we think it's going to go above 2%. We're going to act quickly to tighten monetary policy, raise interest rates to pull it back down. If it's below 2%, we're going to run easy monetary policy and try and uh, get it back up again. 
Last year, they unveiled what they called was a new framework. They said, well, actually, we don't like the fact that over time, it's tended to be below 2%. And we're afraid that if people get used to that, their expectations will shift down and inflation will never go back to 2%. And that's a real problem for us. So we're going to target average inflation of 2%, which means that since it's been below 2% for a while, we want it to run above 2% for a while so that over time it averages 2%. People will expect 2% inflation and we won't slide into those low inflation deflation scenarios like Japan has. I think the question is though, what constitutes success on this front? And so I would actually like to ask the panelists, and I don't know who has a strong view on this, um, is the rise in inflation that we've seen this year consistent with that Fed's new framework? In other words, should the Fed look at the rise in inflation this year and say, nothing to worry about, this is entirely consistent with our new framework, or should they be saying, yeah, this is something to worry about? Um, uh, Tim, do you want to uh, go for that? This is what you do for a living, right? Fed watching. <laughs> yeah, this, and, this, sorry, this is, and teaching economics, as I forget. That's, that's right. Um, this is a fascinating question because, as, as you know, the Fed has not defined what that window over which they're going to measure average inflation is. Uh, and so that creates, from our perspective, a bit of a challenge in assessing what is victory on this front. Um, my my interpretation of their flexible average inflation uh, target is that a shock or a, a sizable inflation shock like we just um, had now, uh, is probably gonna shorten the window around which they think they've, they're, they're gonna be, meet their goals. In fact, you already see them, uh, Fed officials saying that they're, they've made substantial progress toward their inflation goal already. So now that when they talk about tapering, they're really looking at the employment goal. If we had a lower inflation shock, they'd probably make that window a little bit bigger. Right? And so I think that the window probably varies um, uh, relative to the size of the shock to, to as, as far as how they're going to um, uh, define success uh, on this metric. Um, from our perspective, again, I think that success might be, um, uh, can they, in fact, within any normal reasonable time, whether a year or two, hold inflation near um, 2% or maybe, uh, you know, they'd like to do a little bit above it right now to firm up inflation expectations. Uh, but unfortunately, again, we don't have any firm numbers as, as to what the, the Fed thinks that window should be. Um, yeah. Thanks. In fact, um... Ian, since you're, you know, since your clientele is primarily financial markets types, how would you rate the Fed's uh, communication of this framework? Do you believe that there is like a, a, a gap between what the Fed is saying and what the markets actually need to know to understand whether or not we're on uh, what the Fed's reaction function is and whether we're approaching like events are unfolding consistent with their, you know, stated desire to lift off in 2023? Yeah, I think part of the problem here is that markets really like clarity. They like things to be set out in black and white so they know exactly where they stand, so the parameters are clear and understandable. But but to, to echo Tim's point, what we have now is, a, is an environment where the, the, the window where the Fed measures success is kind of a concertina. It can, it can widen, it can shrink. And, and the problem with concertinas, apart from the terrible noise they make, is that it's kind of unpredictable. So, so I think markets are trying to grapple with it. I think there's a fairly high degree of conviction that the Fed is dead serious about the target, about the new, the new framework and the, and the flexible average inflation target. But there's real uncertainty um, and a very widespread of opinion as to exactly you know, where these parameters lie. I just also made the point that the Fed has made itself, given itself quite a, a high bar because they've already got their forecast for the fourth quarter of next year, core PCE going back to the target, was 2.1 rather than 2.0, but going from 3% at the end of this year bang onto the target in just 12 months after that. Now, obviously there'll be some favorable base effects that will help them achieve that, but they really have kind of set themselves up for some very difficult questions in markets if, they, if, you know, if investors don't see that, that relatively rapid projected path coming back down to the target just 12 months after you know, everyone's running around like a headless chicken uh, terrified by the last few months data. So, uh, you know, uh, and then just one final point as well, that, that Fed communication is always difficult when there's a disagreement within the within the FOMC. And I think there's a very clear split now between most of the committee, uh, between most of the governors and the regional Fed presidents. You know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that most of the dots that have been rising in the dot plot belong to the regional guys. 
Whereas I think that the, uh, the, the governors are, most of them are really very much all in on the new strategy and they're, they're pretty determined to, to wait quite a while, uh, you know, take full advantage of that flexibility before they come down on one side of the argument or the other. So Mark is expecting Jay Powell to make some sort of big definitive statement at Jackson Hole in just a few weeks time, right? Well, he doesn't have enough information to do that. So we all got to learn a bit more patience than we used to, I think. Thanks. Well, it's only a very short hop skim to jump from the Federal Reserve to the bond market, which I feel like I have to address here. Now, um, I want to begin by telling a little story. My mother actually uh, was a professional economist. It's probably where I got my interest in this subject. And on her office wall for a long time, she had taped a cartoon and it showed two economists looking at a hamster in a, in a wheel in a hamster cage. And one economist says to the other, well, we don't exactly know why, but when he runs in a clockwise direction, bond yields go up. And then when he runs in a counterclockwise direction, bond yields go down. And I often think about that when I'm trying to understand what the heck is going on in the bond market. Because the 10-year bond yield has, yield has dropped from roughly 1.8% 1. 1. to below 1.5% in a time when we were shocked by these very high inflation numbers. Now, if you look at the components of that bond yield that can be explained by expected inflation, those have also come down a little bit, although they are a little bit somewhat higher than they've been for some years. Long way of saying is that there's a lot more inflation angst in this panel discussion than there is in the bond market. What is going on? Should we all say, take a chill pill, folks, if the bond market people with a lot of money on the line are not worried, we shouldn't be worried at all? Or is there some other completely different universe of facts driving what the bond market is doing? Who wants to tackle that? Can I just say the Fed's bought a lot of bonds in the last few months, <laughs> relative to supply. They've they've bought a lot of bonds, a lot more than a lot more than normal. So we've been through a very unusual period where where the Fed has become the you know the, the buyer of most of the or all of the issues sort of off the top of my head uh, over the last few months. It made, made really quite a big difference. Whereas for the previous year, I mean, after the initial explosion of Fed buying at the, at the start of the pandemic when they bought up everything plus a lot more, they then sort of went into a more settled pattern where the issuance was running ahead. But more recently, they've bought they've bought uh, more than the issuance, and so that's been a sort of a technical factor. Um, you know, uh, plus, of course, I think markets are for now anyway happy to believe uh, Jay Powell and have a lot of confidence in him. We'll, we'll see whether that lasts, but I think it's it's probably a real factor now. Okay. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. In, in a sense, this is the sort of the Fed looking at them in the mirror and seeing what they what they said and then what they want. I mean, they are um, uh, both uh, buying a large number of bonds and they're setting. Um, uh, expectations of policy rates. And those expectations of policy rates should filter into what the price of bonds are in, in the future. Um, there's really, from, from I would say from, from a market perspective, um, uh, there has been no proof that this is going to be a sustained inflationary trend, and there has been no proof yet that that um, uh, um, that the Fed's going to react to that in a certain way. So, so uh, I, I think that there's would be a sort of a normal um, uh, limit to what bond price, what bond yields are going to do, especially you know, a because the Fed has said we think the neutral rate or the terminal rate here is two point five percent, and that at least psychologically, I think is going to put an upper barrier on. On, on how markets react. Also, you know, my my um, uh, my take is that market participants the <laughs> market participants have very little confidence the Fed can raise interest rates without crashing the economy, um, uh, and therefore they're not particularly interested in bidding up uh, yields too high uh, because they know what's going to be on the other side of that in not too long. Fascinating. Well, it's not just the bond market, which seems quite complacent or, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, comfortable or optimistic about the inflation interest rate future. It's also the Biden administration, because they are um, their policies are adding significantly to the uh, uh, federal debt. Um, and I think it's interesting that most of the debate right now about the fiscal stance of the government with all the borrowing and all the stimulus being put into the economy, and certainly in this panel, is about the risks to inflation and very little attention about the risks to debt sustainability. Now, one of the reasons why is because interest rates are very low. So you can carry a lot more debt and the, the actual, uh, the, you, you can carry a much, much larger stock of debt. You know, the debt to GDP ratio can be quite a little, lot higher and the cost of servicing that debt is still fairly low because interest rates are low. But I want to ask the question of whether we are we should see a stronger linkage than we've been seeing between the inflation risks 
and the debt risks. Uh, and I'll put this question to you, Wendy. One of the reasons interest rates are so low is because inflation has been so low and stable, and if anything, it has been actually biased to the downside. And that tends to both reduce term premiums. It means a long way of saying that investors are willing to accept much, much lower interest rates when they just have no concept or fear that inflation will ever be a problem again. If you go back just to the early 1990s, when the level of inflation was only moderately higher today, fear of inflation and the risk of inflation was much higher. And that's one reason why interest rates were much higher. So Wendy, in your view, is there a real risk out here that if inflation becomes more of a problem, that rebounds on uh, interest rates and starts to cause a real problem for the debt situation in this country? It affects different parts of the, an, an increase in inflation affects different parts of the budget differently. So an increase in inflation expectations should absolutely result in higher nominal interest rates, which will in, increase debt service costs. So, uh, and, and so we would, we would expect to see that uh, in the budget and that would worsen debt sustainability. Um, one caveat I'll make to that is that it affects, it, it affects debt sustainability over the longer term. It actually, it, it has slower effects on the deficit than most people intuitively think because only parts of our debt roll over every year. So a lot of that debt is locked in at paying, you know, low interest rates uh, for some time. But 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 for sure over time as in, you know, and interest rates indeed in CBO's baseline are projected to rise and the increase in interest rates absolutely affects debt sustainability over the long term. But one thing I'll say is that higher inflation is also associated with lower primary deficits. Uh, which is to say the deficit excluding interest costs for all sorts of reasons. So, so there are parts of our, you know, there are parts of our tax system that are not indexed for inflation so that higher inflation increases revenues. There are certain kinds of spending that typically fall when, when uh, inflation is higher. So on net, um, it is, it's actually, uh, you know, the sign bounces around depending on, you know, various, various parts of the projection. Uh, as to what the net effect on the deficit is. Um, of course, policymakers can change the tax code anytime they want. Um, so that's not set in stone and interest costs are just a fact of life. So uh, one policymakers have more control over than the other. Um, but, uh, so, but, but um, there's a political science here point here, which is that one of the reasons why I think we're, uh, you know, Generally, the consensus, certain, you know, not 100% consensus, but the main consensus is that, is that debt, you know, financing the debt is not is not terribly onerous right now, is because we're all focused so much on on debt service costs, and just seeing those go up, um, I, I can imagine uh, unnerving people uh, and and thinking that they need to they need to to tackle the deficit more quickly. The last thing I want to say is we have, you know more than enough resources to tackle our debt situation over the longer term. So this raises an issue, but not, a, not an issue that I don't think we can handle. Okay, uh, Jason? Yeah, so you know, I think the most important way to think about the president's proposals are from a micro perspective. Do we need ports? Do we need lead pipes? Do we need preschool? I won't go into that here. I think the answer is mostly yes on most of what he's proposed. Um, from a macro perspective, three lenses. Uh, one, inflation. In 25 years of my working on fiscal policy, that was almost never a consideration. That was almost never, this is bad because of inflation, this is good because of inflation. I think that there was a rare exception in the American Rescue Plan where it was so large and so fast that I do think inflation was a legitimate consideration in thinking about that piece of legislation. But we should go back to the way we've thought about it for the last 25 years for something like this. You spend money three years from now, the Fed can easily offset it if it wants to. So inflation, irrelevant. Um, the second is aggregate demand, fiscal stimulus. Usually that's irrelevant for the same reason I just said, which is the Fed can offset it. I don't believe in a super strong form of secular stagnation, but you know, if we have year in and year out, interest rates were, you know, couldn't fall low enough to ensure we had enough demand, this will help us get out of that. And if that's wrong, the Fed can just raise rates, as I said before. So I think there's a little bit of a one-sided bet of if Larry Summers' most extreme versions were right, this will help us. And if he was wrong, then it won't hurt us. 
Um, but now finally, I do want to talk about fiscal sustainability. That is something I've thought about for 25 years of thinking about fiscal policy. Um, nominal interest rates aren't what matters. It's real interest rates that matter. Because if inflation goes up, then nominal GDP growth is going to go up. And so if you're asking about your debt to GDP, your denominator is going to start rising more quickly. Um, and your debt in the numerator is going to rise more quickly. And the change in both of those are going to be exactly the same. So nominal interest rates do not affect the sustainability of debt as a share of the economy. Another way to think about that is nominal interest rates that change just because of inflation. Another way to think about that is inflation's higher. We're going to inflate away more of our debt each year. Um, it's a non-trivial fact that we are of a government spending program that's minus 2% of GDP right now. And that's called inflating the debt, or this year it's even more than that. Um, that didn't used to be that important a consideration. It's a more important one now. So the real fiscal risk we have is to real interest rates. I think all of this is putting some upward pressure on real interest rates, but you know, if the 10 year went up to three and a half or 4%, the president's fiscal trajectory, I think would still broadly speaking be consistent with you know, an okay amount of debt service. So uh, just moderated for, uh, prerogative, Jason. I think one of the points I was trying to get at was that inflation risk high, is that uh, real rates are themselves associated with higher perceived inflation risk. So we go from a world where inflation risks are two-sided instead of always to the downside, real rates could be higher. Anyway. Yeah, no, no, if some uh, risk yeah. premium rises, yeah. so real rates rise, yes, okay. I mean, can that rise by 50 or 100 basis points? I don't think so. Uh, let's see, how much time do we have? I actually want to get to a couple of the audience questions here. So um, uh, let me go to the first one. A couple of people have asked about the money supply. Money supply uh, M1, M2 uh, has been growing very strongly double digit rates. Is that something to worry about? Anybody want to uh, take a whack at that? Uh, right. Ian? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not a monetarist, but when I look at money supply growth, that's twice as fast as it ever was in the 1970s, you know, even at the peak of the extreme inflation lunacy, uh, you know, I think it would be remiss not to ask the question of, of whether it's something we should be concerned about. Obviously, you know, right now, the flip side of the, the massive expansion of M2 has been a massive drop in velocity. So, you know, net net, it hasn't created inflation beyond, you know, any, anything that would be, you know, the, the, the reopening spike in, 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 the, in the services components. Um, it hasn't, you know, it hasn't generated anything disconcerting yet, but, you know, it is just going to be sat there. Uh, that money's not going to go away. The Fed having created it is not going to be destroying it anytime soon. They might be slowing the rate of creation, but they aren't going to be shrinking it anytime soon. And unlike, you know, the, the, the burst of money supply growth that we had after the crash in 2008 from the Fed's buying, at that point, the banks were all bust. So they were destroying money and offsetting some of the, the stuff the Fed was adding. That's not happening now. The banking system is in rude good health and perfectly capable of creating private credit, augmenting the push from the Fed. So um, this is a very difficult thing now because you know, there's not very many monetarists left in the world anymore, I, you know, after the, after the repeated <laughs> failures of monetarist-based forecasting. But I just look at that, that the chart and I look at the numbers and I think, well, you know, if we do have an accident with velocity, then, you know, we're going to be in, in, in Larry Summers' world of rampant inflation. I just, I don't have a firm view on whether it's going to happen, but I think it's a sensible thing to think about. And I'm, I'm not going to dismiss it, you know, just because M2 is not fashionable anymore. You know, it's, it's, it's meaningful. It's gigantic. Yeah. Um, yes, I think the, the, uh, the quantity theory of money is right up there with the Phillips curve in terms of like models that people always like invoke nowadays to explain inflation. But maybe someday it will come back in time. Velocity, that's one that I haven't heard in a while. Um, another question we've got from some of the uh, members of the audience is, well, we're seeing simply eye-popping rates of home price appreciation. Like I think the uh, uh, the repeat home sales index was up 15% year on year. We haven't seen uh, rate inc annual increases like that ever. Uh, homes are one of those weird things in that they're both an asset and a commodity. But I'd just like to ask the panelists, how worried should we about what's, or how pleased should we be about what's going on in home prices? Is that sui generis or is that telling us something troubling or uh, interesting about either inflation or the economy? Anyone want to uh, tackle that? I'll, I'll give some thoughts. I mean, 
um, uh, you know, one thing I, I think is that we, we kind of forget that there's a real demand surge going on right now, given the, the demographics, the millennials aging into their home buying years, and that's creating a, a lot of demand for um, housing. The supply side's not responding quite as quickly. Um, uh, and I thought of this when, when Wendy was talking about, you know, are we going to overproduce? And builders are very much still in shock over the last cycle. And they don't seem to be producing as much housing as we'd be necessary to um, uh, hold housing prices down. Um, also, I think related to this is low interest rates, which then get capitalized into higher housing prices. And this also gets back, I think, to the, the point of M1 or more broadly, just the amount of money that's been pushed out in the economy, the high growth of nominal GDP is going to support high wage and salary growth, which is also going to be able to support high, higher home prices. So somehow this is all tied in together. It's the demographics, it's the um, money pumped in the economy, it's um, the slow respi supply response, all working, I think, to, to sustain a very high level of housing prices. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Tim, actually, we have a question specifically for you. Based on the beverage curve, what do you think is the short run natural rate of unemployment right now? And how much is it above the long run natural rate of unemployment? <laughs> That's a great question. I don't have an estimate of that. Um, uh, it could be, you know, it's near where we're at right now. Uh, given the wage growth that we've seen, it would not be crazy to think that we're near it. Um, what I did find interesting is in, after the last recession, you know, we raised our estimates to the short run narrow, um, and then we decided that was a mistake. So this time we didn't do that. Um, and it might be that this, this was the time uh, uh, to actually think about that. Kind of sort of like uh, we're going to be wrapping this up in a few minutes time. It's been a great conversation. I want to finish with a couple of like really big picture questions. Um, often over the last decade or two, people would explain the decline and the low level of inflation uh, through secular forces. They would talk about globalization, for example, the fact that like we now have competition from all around the world uh, that takes pricing power away from companies. They talk about demographics, the influx of all these low wage workers from China and Eastern Europe had basically pulled down uh, wages and that um, they talked about uh, te technology like the Amazon effect and all these sorts of things. My question uh, to the panelists is are some, some of those secular forces going to reverse in ways that make the inflation outlook a bit more troubling? For example, uh, Charles Goodhart and Manoj Pardon have written a book argue, called The Great Demographic Reversal that says as the world ages uh, in coming years, this is going to shrink the supply of labor. Uh, it's going to basically create an imbalance between the number of people producing, that's to say workers, and the number of people consuming, which would be, you know, include both workers and retirees. And that puts upper pressure on inflation. Do any of the panelists have a view on whether that is indeed some latent uh, um, factor out there putting upward pressure on inflation? First of all, I think some of these structural arguments are a little bit overstated. You know, a lot of these structural forces were similar for a range of countries that had different inflation rates. You know, Japan, Europe, the United States, Canada, you know, Australia all had different trend inflation rates. Some of that was because of different demography. And then you add in emerging markets and they had, you know, even further difference. So, you know, you could have a 4% inflation rate a year in a world with a certain type of demography if you did things with fiscal and monetary policy to get that. Um, and conversely, you could have a 0% inflation rate. So I think we don't want to overstate the structural forces too much. Um, I think the Goodhart thesis is an intriguing one. And so, yeah, I do think it's possible that insofar as we do think these structural forces matter, that some of them start to change. Productivity is a big um, question mark in all of this. I think if there is a big productivity speed up for a number of years, that would that would probably help us in the same way that it did in the mid 1990s. I, I think okay. these demographic. I'm sorry. I think, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I think, sorry. I think these demographic effects are having much much more significant effects, notable effects on real interest rates, um, and and productivity growth. Um, I think I think that's that's where to put the attention rather rather than inflation. Interesting, thanks. Um, so the, my final question is, is really, really big picture. And it has to do with the idea that inflation seems to go through regimes from low inflation regimes to high inflation regimes and back to low again. Um, and Ian, you, I think, uh, alluded to that, I think, in your uh, some of um, the slides from your presentation. 
But what's interesting is that these changes in inflation regime were often associated with a change in the political regime. For example, when Roosevelt left uh, gold uh, and the New Deal in the 1930s, uh, the Great Society Vietnam War Watergate period in the 60s and the 70s was associated with high uh, double digit inflation, Thatcherism, Reaganomics in the early 1980s associated with low inflation. It's, there's arguments to be made that we could be going through a political regime change right now, you know, where we have seen at least since uh, including the last, uh, the Trump administration, this one, a definite pushback against globalization, free trade, and so forth, some of those uh, factors, a degree of populism out there, uh, uh, awareness of uh, inequality being a, something that macro policymakers should focus on rather than uh, in, uh, efficiency and so forth. So my question to the panelists is, do you see out there the makings in our political and sociological environment of a regime shift that could also make society more tolerant of inflation in years to come. Ian? Yeah, yeah um, I, think, I think what we have, what I would call now a populism window, which is kind of the, the sweet spot for populism is when inflation has been low, so people don't have a memory of how disruptive and damaging it is. Uh, and also people, especially in Europe um, and in the UK in particular, where there's a great deal of, of unhappiness with extended fiscal austerity. I mean, you know, the, the fiscal response uh, to COVID has been much smaller in Europe and fiscal policy was much tighter before COVID struck. So there's been a long period of austerity. People are very unhappy about it and can't really see a good reason why it should continue. Um, and, you know, the initial phase of, of a populist wave of spending is just going to be, it's going to look good to people because it means more growth and, and higher wages and all the rest of it. And the potential cost comes later. But these things do come in, in quite big waves. And it's not obvious to me that this populism window will close very quickly. I mean, it might uh, depending on the factors we've been talking about, but it, it might last for you know a decade or more. At which point it starts to look structural, whether it whether it's structural or super cyclical is a different debate. But it starts to to look that way. But but I, I certainly think that that right now the circumstances are are kind of ripe for a, a change in the political environment and the, the labour market zeitgeist and the way people think about fiscal policy. That yeah, you know, this is a time where populism is, is gaining a real foothold, and that means more spending, more deficits, and potentially more inflation down the line. I think there's been less of a paradigm shift in fiscal policy than people think there has been. I think there's actually been less of one than there probably should be. Um, we spent a huge amount during the pandemic, but we're not going to be sending $2,000 checks to people, you know, every year going on uh, into the future. And, um, and, you know, just look at, at, you know, Biden and the Congress, they sort of are paying lip service to paying for everything. Now, a lot of the offsets are not going to add up to quite what they say they're going to, et cetera. Um, but the paradigm hasn't changed that much. I think monetary policy is more of the question mark, which is, I don't think the Fed's going to tomorrow announce a 3% inflation target. But if inflation for the next two years, in 2022 and 2023, is closer to 3%, is the Fed really going to want to get it down from 3 to 2 Or the, their next framework review, are they going to switch to a two to three percent range or a three percent target or something like that? I think there's been growing support for that for some time. And it's not just populist support. It's, you know, among, you know, economists that are worried about it, you know, low interest rates and the like. So I think there's a non-trivial chance that the Fed's next framework has some higher range for inflation unless we end up that magically back at two next year, in which case I don't think they'll do that. But if, I think if we end up at three, we'll, we'll stay there and that'll be fine and good. There's certainly a political aspect to that with some expected vacancies coming up on the board of governors. Um, we could see you know, more, um, uh, you know, more appointees that might be sympathetic to, to what Jason uh, just suggested, uh, sort of a higher inflation target somewhere down the road. Um, it's not is not crazy. I would sort of say like the possibility that we have these child tax credits that that are ongoing after this next year that could be something of a of a shift in in the fiscal um, a proto populist fiscal shift that you know could be much much you know much more of the direction of of what Ian was 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 discussing than than maybe um, uh, sort of what the most recent discussion of um, uh, the the infrastructure package has been. So I, I know we're out of time, but I want to just say two quick things. So one, um, if if the if monetary policymakers adopted a higher inflation target, um, 
And, and let's say they did that when they were, you know, facing 3% inflation and they were thinking about getting it down to 2% inflation and they decided to stick it at three. Like that transition moment has economic effects that they're basically going to transition the target to three, let's say. But once you get beyond the transition that, that, that might have positive effects in terms of monetary policy and the effectiveness of monetary policy over the long term, but that, that shouldn't affect the economy over the long term. But let me take then your, the presumption of your, of your question, let me just take it as given and say that there has been a regime shift. I think what that, might, what that would imply if there indeed has been from all those forces you just talked about is a larger government going forward. So, an, you know, an, an increase in the share of economic activity that the government takes up. But, but what that implies over the long term is a larger government and a smaller private sector, which may well be exactly, you know, the regime shift that we're in for, you know, if, you know, Jason was skeptical, sure. but, but, but that again, only affects growth or in the, that's, that's a sustainable outcome over time. That doesn't necessarily imply a, a difference in inflation. Interesting. It's just, it's okay. just the composition yeah. of the economy. Absolutely, yeah. You know, there have been large governments and low inflation and small governments, high inflation, absolutely. Um, well, this has been a, we're out of time now. It's been a great panel discussion. I will say that I began this very uncertain where inflation is going, and I am this very uncertain where inflation is going. <laughs> but whereas at the start, my uncertainty was rooted in ignorance, my uncertainty now is rooted in excessive knowledge of the many conflicting forces playing on this question over the next year. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the audience uh, for your terrific questions and your attention and your time. Uh, thank you to Amaya and uh, Mark and the Committee for a Responsible uh, Federal Budget for sponsoring this event. Uh, goodbye, everybody, and have a great afternoon.